All right, mm. Crystal, what are you taking a look at? Well, guys, we are still learning all the details of the horrific mass shooting in Buffalo, New York, and are really just scratching the surface of what led an 18-year-old down the path of violent white supremacist ideology culminating in the hate-fueled massacre of innocent people. Already, though, Fox News is out there floating some of the dumbest possible explanations. It seems like these things have gotten so much worse since video uh, games became so realistic and so violent. Uh, have you done research or, you know, so, uh, learned that, that video games uh, tend to just desensitize people to the actual um, results of pulling a trigger? This is such a classic, like, vintage conservative response as to almost be quaint. So, once again, no, video games do not cause violent behavior. It turns out kids and adults alike are perfectly capable of distinguishing between video game violence and real-life violence. And before you ask, this isn't about rap music or violent movies either. Not to be undone, however, Democratic Governor of New York Kathy Hochul is using this shooting to call for tech companies to engage in war censorship. Here with me now is New York Governor Kathy Hochul. Uh, Governor, thank you so much for joining me. I'm sorry it's under these conditions. Can you first tell us what more you've learned about the shooter's motive and this purported manifesto? Well, this manifesto tells everything to us, and that is what's so bone-chilling about it, is that there is the ability for people to write and subscribe to such uh, philosophies filled with hate, the white supremacists, acts of terrorism that are being fomented on social media, and to know that what this one individual did has been shared with the rest of the world, as well as the live streaming of this military-style execution that occurred in the, home, in the streets of my hometown. And that is what is so fundamentally disturbing about this, that this is not just a uh, long time ago, members of the KKK would sit in a hall and plot what they're gonna do in their community. This spreads like a virus. And that's why I'm calling on the CEOs of all the social media platforms to examine their policies and to be able to look me in the eye and tell me that everything is being done that they can to make sure that this information is not spread. They have to be able to identify when information like this, the second it hits the platform, it needs to be taken down because this is spreading like wildfire. These theories mm -hmm. that result in the radicalization of a young person sitting in their house is deeply scary and yeah. it's something that has to be dealt with. Now, it is true that this killer says that he was radicalized online. It is also true that hateful ideologies somehow managed to spread before there was 4chan. In fact, the Klan was quite adept at getting their message out through magazines and newspapers. And I personally would rather know what these violent extremists are up to and how they've arrived at their twisted views than to allow them to fester in the dark corners of the internet where no dissenting voices are around to challenge them whatsoever. In any case, begging tech oligarchs to claim more power is unlikely to be the answer to any of our society's problems. Now, another common causal explanation has been the replacement rhetoric embraced by Republican media figures, including Tucker Carlson and Republican elected leaders. The basic play here is to talk in apocalyptic terms about declines in fertility rates, demographic change, and immigration, and to posit that this is all being done intentionally by Democratic elites in order to cement a permanent electoral majority. Now, I know that the left and all the little gatekeepers on Twitter become literally hysterical if you use the term replacement, if you suggest that the Democratic Party is trying to replace the current electorate, the voters now casting ballots, with new people, more obedient voters from the third world. But they become hysterical because that's, that's what's happening, actually. Let's just say it, that's mm. true. Let's say that again for emphasis because it is the secret to the entire immigration debate. Demographic change is the key to the Democratic Party's political ambitions. In other words, you're being replaced and there's nothing you can do about it, so shut up. <laughs> I mean, they're trying to change the population of the United States, and they hate it when you say that because it's true. Our country's being invaded by the rest of the world. I mean, the state unequivocally, the country's being stolen from American citizens as we watch. In political terms, this policy is called the Great Replacement, the replacement of legacy Americans with more obedient people from faraway countries. 
placement of legacy Americans with more obedient people from faraway countries. Listen, first of all, the scapegoating of immigrants, fear-mongering about your country being stolen from you by invaders, it's gross. It's hateful. It does, in fact, echo the replacement theory ideology which the Buffalo shooter says motivated him to kill. Second of all, this doesn't honestly sound much different from the standard issue conservative rhetoric that I've heard my entire life about this or that bad group threatening the white American way of life. It's pretty standard issue Southern strategy type of stuff. Third, if this is actually the Democratic plan for electoral dominance, they are extremely shitty at it. After all, the only demographic group that Democrats actually improved with in 2020 was white men. If there is one Obama-era talking point which has been thoroughly discredited, it's that America's shifting demographics would automatically inure to the benefit of the Democratic Party. Finally, as far as I can tell, Tucker Carlson has two basic goals. Own and enrage the libs and to convince people to vote for shitty Republican politicians who in no way deserve your support. In service of these two goals, he engages in all sorts of contemptible rhetoric that is no doubt bad for the country, even if you can't and should not draw a direct line between Tucker monologues and racist massacres. But frankly, I wish that our problems were as easy to solve as taking Tucker Carlson off the air or censoring hate speech on the internet or toning down the violence in video games. None of these really addresses any of the root causes of the scourge of hate and violence in our society. To really deal with this, we're going to have to go a lot deeper than a Tucker monologue. Now, one of the places to start that gets little mainstream discussion is the consistent relationship between our wars and interventions abroad and spikes in extremist violence at home. Now, it kind of makes some sense, right? You train a bunch of young men to kill. You desensitize them to human life. You normalize violence. They experience a profound adrenaline rush, sense of camaraderie and shared purpose, all of which vanishes when they return home, many with injuries to either their body or their brain or both. Now, you layer on top of that the frequent abandonment of veterans after their service and the emasculation of struggling to reintegrate into society, and that leaves you with the potentially toxic brew. University of Chicago researcher Kathleen Ballou, author of the book Bring the War Home, has delved deep into the roots of the modern white power movement and finds that the particular brand of anti-government racist extremis- extremism that we've seen flare up since the 80s, it actually came directly out of the failures and the violence of the Vietnam War. I think the thing that really brought these activists together was a shared experience of the Vietnam War. Now, for some of them, this had to do with literal combat in Vietnam. Um, and for veterans and active duty troops that came into the movement um, in its early formation, um, that certainly was the case. But this story about the Vietnam War became something much bigger and broader and something that was open to people who didn't fight and open to women and open to younger activists. And the idea was sort of that the government was the site of betrayal, the site of um, all problems and and a direct threat to their nation. So the Vietnam War was really the catalyst that brought these activists together. And it also provided the uniforms, language, tactics, and weapons that escalated the impact of this movement over the years that followed. Now, what was even more fascinating to me, though, is that the most accurate predictor of racist hate movements is not cultural change. It's not poverty. It's not video games or 4chan, for that matter, either. It's actually war. We can see that across the run of American history, the best predictor for surges in right-wing violent activity and militant activity. Um, are The best predictor is not poverty or immigration or reactionary mindset or the advances of communities of color. The best predictor is the aftermath of warfare. We see hmm. surges of the Klan after the Civil War, after World War I, after World War II, after Korea, after Vietnam, and we're seeing one now um, with the global war on terror. Um, I skipped the Gulf War, but of course the Gulf War fueled the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995, which was carried out by a white power activist with other movement um, connections. And one thing to think about here is that this is really not just veterans. In fact, the research shows us coming out of sociology that all measures of violence are higher in the aftermath of warfare. So it isn't that war is creating violence among these groups. It's that these groups, which use opportunistic recruitment and radicalization practices, are able to take advantage of this broader disaffection and violent tendency in society in those moments. And that's what really escalates their membership numbers and creates opportunities for violent impact. This connection between war and violence at home is not limited to America, of course. After all, the Nazi movement came directly out of the humiliation of World War I. Now listen, I'm going to be very clear in saying two things. First of all, this is in no way to disparage all military veterans as racist thugs. Quite the contrary. These trends are about a very small fringe percentage of veterans and like-minded civilians. Second of all, as always, detailing the sociological conditions that breed extremism in no way absolves the extremists themselves of culpability for their violent acts. 
The link between war abroad and violence at home, it does make some sense. Some of the white power leaders who came out of Vietnam spoke directly about how violence begets violence, explaining they couldn't really see the difference between the government-sanctioned killings abroad and their ideological race war at home. According to Ballou, white power movement leader Louis Beam explained to a reporter described, uh, who was disguised as a Klansman, quote, I knew the battle was not over. The mere fact that I had returned from Vietnam did not mean the war was over. It was going on right here in the States. I knew right then and there I had to get engaged again and fight the enemy. Over here, if you kill the enemy, you go to jail. Over there in Vietnam, if you killed the enemy, they gave you a medal. I couldn't see the difference. Gives new meaning to the phrase forever war. For these dudes, killing commies and hating Jews and black people, well, that was all bundled up together. What's more, in the Vietnam War, as in our Reagan-era Cold War interventions, and as in Iraq, and as in Afghanistan, little distinction was made between civilians and combatants. And if the government couldn't be counted on to finish the job, well then, these extremists would take it on themselves. I have no doubt that the reasons the U.S. stands out in terms of violence in general, mass shootings in particular, are complex and very multifaceted. But this connection between violent, hate-filled ideology and war is as relevant as ever, considering that plenty of our political class have launched headlong into a new Cold War with Russia, and that some seem to be pushing for even more than that. The ugly deeds we enlist Americans in abroad do not stay overseas. The dehumanization of innocent civilians is not bounded by oceans or by borders. And that's to say nothing of the billions in weapons that we're sending with zero accountability into the hands of God knows who in Ukraine. Something tells me you're not going to hear much about this research as the Senate votes this week on tens of billions more in weapon shipments. Um, Sagar, you know, it's very easy, and I feel like liberals like to do this. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.